2023's No One Will Save You Review and Thoughts. I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie that I really loved. This video will have some jokes, none at the expense of members or minorities, and I will get into some serious topics. I realize this video is long, I'm doing what I can to make it worth your time. I start the video with a review where I'm almost definitely not going to spoil anything, but if I end up deciding to spoil something, I'm going to verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead and choose to see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself and get into the thoughts section, which again, I will verbally let you know, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. And so yeah uh since the lead is female i want to make clear i am a lifelong feminist but i am an allo cishet man as such i've never lived life as a woman says or trans i try to show empathy listen to the lived experience of women but i am aware i have dead spots as such i might accidentally say something ignorant if any feminist women is bothered by something I say in one of my videos, please let me know. I am open to editing that part out, and if it, if it is a case where the whole video is bad, taking it down. So this is rated PG-13, and in some ways it definitely does push the PG-13, which we've seen recently. We've also seen a number of comic book movies do this. So. You know, a horror movie that's PG-13 in the year 2023 is not the same as, like, 2001, for example. And, uh, yeah, a, a lot of the, the stuff that's scary, it is more psychological than, like, visceral. But the visceral stuff, there is some of that, and it is quite effective, so, uh, the MPAA rated PG-13 for violent content and terror, and the MDB Parents Guide, uh, yeah, sex and nudity, none, moderate violence and gore, no profanity, no alcohol, drugs, and smoking, severe, frightening, and intense scenes. And, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And, let's see... That right, so yeah, I've watched this movie once. I just got done finish, just got done watching it before I started recording this video. And yeah, so the plot I'm going to be quoting IMDb here an exiled, anxiety ridden homebody must let's see, I don't want to give too much away deal with a situation in her home and let's see so the um, right um, yeah before I get too much into it the technical aspects are quite impressive the people here are very talented there's a lot of skill and enthusiasm on display and let's see so, this movie has at least one element that I've seen some refer to as a plot twist, and others say that it's too obvious to be a plot twist. I think the truth is somewhere in between. I would definitely say that you can guess where it's going from early on. I don't think that's a bad thing, but I am aware that bothers some people. You know, you can think of it as a classic Greek, Greek tragedy, like a, one of those stage plays where you know going into it how it's going to go, like watching Shakespeare. You know, the they don't tend to change the ending of Shakespeare plays. We know how it's going to go. The interesting thing is seeing how it gets there, the the um, ideas explored over the course of it, you know the the Hamlet that um, Mel Gibson's Hamlet is incredibly different from Sir Lawrence Olivier's Hamlet. They're both well worth watching. Although I can understand if you don't want to support Mel Gibson, you know they're they're very different films. They have yeah. 
even though they're based on the same core text. So that's the that's how I would view this. I I I don't I th I think you're going to be disappointed if you go into this movie expecting like plot twists as as such. Now the let's see yes so this was both written and directed by Brian Duffield and this let's see it it is his the the second feature film that he directs the first one being 2020's Spontaneous which I'm I'm just going to read the the IMDb plot summary. Get ready for the outrageous coming of age love story about growing up and blowing up. When students in their school begin exploding, literally, seniors Mara and Dylan struggle to survive in a world where each moment may be their last. So, that's definitely I would I would very much like to watch that movie. I do not currently have access to it. But yeah, um other than that, there's a couple of movies that he wrote him. He wrote Insurgent, one of the Divergent movies, but I think we should forgive that. I, th I think this movie proves that he has significant, he has a lot to, to offer. And let's see, he wrote the 2015 movie Jane Got a Gun, which, yeah, I, I, I don't really know much of anything about the, he wrote the 2017 movie The Babysitter, directed by McGee. Which, you know, I can imagine you've heard of it. Um, yeah, it's it's the one where Bella Thorne is like in a cheerleader's. Is that a cheerleader? I think I feel like that's a cheerleader's uniform, and there's. Yeah, it's. Um, yeah, you know, it's a it's a movie about an an attractive babysitter that turns out to be to be hiding something really dark. He wrote Underwater, which I if it was if it had been more positively received, I would almost definitely watch because it does look very very interesting. Uh let's see. And he wrote uh, Love and Monsters, which I hear great things about. And he wrote, uh, oh, right, he, he created the animated Skull Island, which is, of course, about King Kong. Uh, yeah, Netflix animated series about King Kong, which, haven't watched it, it looks interesting. And this does very much feel like the the you know when when you have someone writing and directing um, a movie, there's there's really no chance that there's going to be a clash of perspectives. You know sometimes it's a great thing when you have one person or multiple people writing a movie and someone else directing it, someone that didn't help write it sometimes they can really bring out the best in each other and sometimes it's interesting seeing the the different perspectives clash but this is very much a case where yeah it's, it's you know very clear he had a very particular vision for it and it absolutely comes through like it doesn't feel like he's being restrained in that and some people really didn't like his vision and that's of course 100 percent like you know I, w I would never want to force someone to you know you don't you don't have to like it i think it is very interesting and i personally did like it and i try to support the ones that i think are interesting even when i don't like the the final result so Let's see. Yeah, so the the online critic reviews are worth reading, and I don't want for it to become too big a part of my videos for me to go over user reviews that I dislike. I'll try to keep this short. There are multiple positive critic reviews that say this is. Uh, let's 
see. Yeah, that that it is a horror. It is scary. I agree with them. The fact that there are negative user reviews that dispute those two claims is not why I dislike them. I you know I try to highlight negative reviews that I disagree with when I think that they explain well what it is they think is bad in the thing that they're reviewing. That's my issue with several of the negative reviews that claim it isn't horror. They don't say why. They don't put into words what horror means to them and why this doesn't qualify as horror. Horror is one of the single most versatile genres. Essentially the only thing required for something to qualify as horror is that for at least someone makes them scared, deeply uncomfortable, grossed out, or even sad. You know, un you know under certain circumstances something that is otherwise thought as more of a drama thing. I, I try to never declare something as, as not being horror that I think an argument could be made is horror, especially if someone else does consider it to be horror. And let's see. So, so let's see. Yeah, okay, I'll just very briefly. So, yeah, various types of, of horror. Psychological horror, like the ring, gore, heavy slashers, like the new Halloween trilogy. Supernatural horror, like the Paranormal Activity series. Horror comedy, like the Evil Dead franchise. Zombie horror, like the trilogy of the dead. Torture porn, like Sinister. Like, a lot of these have traits that the others don't. And if I'm, if, if I feel like watching one of them, I might be really frustrated if I can only find one of the other types that I, at the time, don't feel like. But what you'll not see me do is leave a negative review either saying that it's not horror, when as I've just explained, it is, especially without explaining what I would consider horror, or saying that it's bad because it wasn't what I wanted or expected. Like, for some people, horror is jump scares, and that's fine. That's not, I'm not the biggest fan of horror that primary, primarily relies on jump scares, but yeah, this has a non-zero amount of jump scares. You know, some people hate that there's jump scares. I probably sound like I'm one of them. I'm not all the scares in this movie are are jump scares. Now, let's see. Yeah, so the yeah, it becomes clear to the audience that the protagonist was limited to the few locations in the movie long before the events that we see in the movie, so it underlines her physical isolation, her feeling trapped, which is something that can be deeply effective in horror and is handled well here. Obviously, a lot of horror limits the freedom of movement of the character since it can be very straightforward for horror. Like, hypothetically, it's scarier to be stuck in a place with a scary thing than seemingly be able to leave the place where the scary thing is. And also, if you establish tension in one location and then you move to another location, you may have to start all over. Add to it that it means they don't have to spend as much of the often for horror limited budget on locations. So either it won't cost as much, or that money can go into special effects, or you know, paying for expensive talented actors. Not that all talented, you know, some <clears throat> some talented actors. No. Not all expensive actors are talented, not all unexpensive actors are untalented. And, you know, here, there is also thematic reason and weight to it. It is a fundamental aspect of the lead character. So, some things that I saw user reviewers say, one per at least one person said, it would be better as a short than it is as a feature. I really can't argue with that. I, I enjoyed every moment I spent watching this. I did not at all feel like the movie was wasting my time. I didn't find it to feel padded, but I can absolutely understand why some people do feel that way. And it definitely, like, it did not need to be 90 minutes and, or 88 without end credits. And really the reason that it is, is because there is an expectation for that. Like, if you put out roughly 90 minutes of movie, you're going to have an easier time getting as many eyeballs as possible on that thing than if you, if what you make is basically an episode of a TV show or streaming show, which I think, 
you know, you'd, you'd have to rewrite it. You couldn't just edit it. But this could definitely be, like, a 42-minute episode of a show. And, and, like, these days, you know, shows are not limited to... It doesn't have to be 42 minutes. I've seen shows that have episodes where it's, like, an hour. And, yeah, some somewhere around that, between 42 minutes and an hour of this, again, it would have to be rewritten from the start... You'd, you'd definitely lose some really compelling stuff if you tried to edit it down like that. But yeah, um, ultimately it doesn't quite have... I think it might have benefited from doing the same thing that Barbarian did, where partway through there is just straight up a perspective switch. And, you know, like... At first, you're you're maybe like, what? Is the, why did that? Why are we showing this other person? And you know, very quickly, it becomes clear. Oh, this is this is extremely thematically relevant. I th I think that would have been. I th I think this movie might have been better if maybe not exactly that. I'm not. You know, I I do think Brian Duffield d definitely had some some really compelling stuff here. But, but maybe something like that. And there actually, there is a thing in this where I thought it was maybe going there, but it didn't really, it didn't quite go the way that it seemed like it would. But, yeah. Um, honestly, I, th I think it would be, you know, maybe maybe we should try to make it a thing for movies to be, like, you know, a couple of weeks ago I watched Host. That one's, you know, like 54 minutes if you don't count the end credits. I don't think that ever went to theaters. As far as I could tell, it only went to, it went direct to streaming. But, like, yeah, this is, yeah. Anyway, uh, let's see. Some, right, some user reviewers said it felt gimmicky, such as for the small amount of dialogue. Though they do admit that the visual storytelling made it you know, made made more dialogue unnecessary for the film. I can definitely see what they mean. I 100%... Um, there's the, the, like... Someone pointed out that because there's no dialogue, instead... Like, it's not that the lead is completely non-verbal, or wait, no, no, it's not that she doesn't, it's, she's not, like, never making a sound with her vocal cords, it's that it's a lot of sighing, whimpering, panting, and that sort of thing, and when there's no dialogue, when there's no s spoken lines to break that up, that can get a little, like, do not make a drinking game out of it, you will, like, pass out. If you if you take a, a shot every single time that that she not not like makes a noise but makes a type of noise that we've already heard her make and that's again a thing where if this was like 42 minutes that wouldn't get to be as you know, and I get it like I think it would have been very awkward if she just made no sound at all throughout the entire thing but I can understand why it bothered some people. It didn't. Per it didn't take me out of it, but it wasn't like. I definitely noticed it, and let's see. But but yeah, the visual storytelling is really really great, and I think <clears throat> this is the kind of thing that kind of underlines some people, some filmmakers who were otherwise talented, kind of use dialogue and and spoken lines as just. An, an easy out, you know, I, I don't like the word lazy, I feel like it's, it's basically a concept made up by capitalists to, to make people feel bad for, you know, depression, anxiety, lack of motivation, stuff like that, so I'm not going to use that word, but, you know, yeah, it, it can feel like, you know, certainly, I love the work of Christopher Nolan, um, I do think there are times where he just has characters just say a thing, and it's like, okay, you you want us to notice that thing. It didn't really feel like 
that was necessarily something someone would say in the circumstance. Now, yeah, some some have argued that there's too little context, even by the ending. I disagree, but I definitely appreciate that that is something like some people will wish there was more, and I'm not saying they're wrong. I, I think it's good to know going into it that that's going to be the case. And, yeah, uh, some user viewers say that the, uh, it'll be easier if I, you know, the protagonist is played by Caitlin Dever. I must say I am a big fan of, I'm, I'm assuming that she is related to the incredibly talented, can you tell I'm buying time, Winston Dever. Uh, but yeah, she plays Bryn. She is our protagonist, and some say Bryn makes smart decisions throughout. Some say she makes terrible decisions throughout. And yeah, it is very much like, yeah, some people are going to feel one way about it. Some people are going to feel another way. I was never, like, frustrated. I could always understand why she made the decisions that she made. And I think that is about... Yeah, I I didn't like I I do think that there is, I there are some horror stories that work really well because characters are making bad decisions, but then there are others where the characters just make bad decisions, just so it so it's easier to write. You know, it's easy to get people into dangerous situations if they're making choices that you know bad choices that put them in those situations, and. Yeah, this didn't feel like like she was like like the writer was having her make bad decisions. It in fact, it yeah, to me it felt like smart decisions. It felt like she was in a situation that was extremely difficult to escape. I thought they did a really great job making it feel inescapable. And yeah, some yes. I agree with the following. There was enough variety. It doesn't stand still for long. I was never bored. However, some people say the exact opposite of that. It get it's very difficult to to know exactly. Like, yeah, I I it is. I think if you compare it to movies from decades ago, you know, if you look at like movies of a similar subgenre from like the 80s you know yes this has more variety than those do you know which is not to impugn there's there's some classics from from the 80s now let's see yeah some people were very upset at the fact that there's so little so so few spoken lines and some claimed that if if the actor is not speaking lines, that means she isn't acting. Which I really hope this is something that that these people come to realize that it's completely like it's. I hesitate to say that it's the exact opposite. It is extremely difficult to act only with your your face. You, you know, if if you don't, if you're not allowed to say lines, because, and you can, you know, you can try this yourself. You can like act it against a mirror, or you can like film yourself. You don't have to show it to anyone. Just watch it back afterwards. Try saying something and imbuing that with emotion. You can even have a character. Like you can, you can have a character like cry and say, "I'm fine." You know, obviously. They're not fine, but they're. It's conveying that they're, like, they they won't say out loud that they're upset. And then you can try to to just without speaking a word, just with with facial acting conveying a, a complex emotion. It's extremely difficult, and yeah. I acknowledge some people really don't like. I, I saw this same thing in reviews of the host. 
not the, of Host, the 2020 movie. The, um, now if I'll just real quick, the 2020 movie Host, directed and in part written by Rob Savage. You know, I, in reviews of that, you also had people complaining that there wasn't enough dialogue. I get that there's a lot of movies that have a lot of dialogue. I just mentioned Christopher Nolan. I really think it's important to be open to different kinds of approaches to filmmaking. Like, there's certain stuff that I think makes for better movies. I greatly appreciate when they remove the lens cap before turning on the camera. I like when the audio is crisp, but beyond stuff like that, I think you should be able to do pretty much anything, and I really admire someone who actually goes out in there and says, you know what, I'm going to make a movie that has almost no dialogue. Like, it's, it's wild, and it was, it's justified, you know, there is, like, I've already mentioned she's somewhat isolated, like, the, the uh, Saying words is one of the primary ways that we communicate with other human beings. You know, obviously this is not the case for, for people who are deaf and or mute. They use sign language. But a lot of people, you know, yeah. For, if, if you're not deaf or mute, very likely you, you communicate by speaking words. Not just words in general, not just by, you know, not only by writing words, but if if you're face to face with someone, or you know, on on a Zoom call or something, you're probably speaking words, and the fact that there are so few spoken words here really underline. And I think that was part of. It. I think people were uncomfortable, and that's why you're watching. Why are you watching a horror movie? You don't want to be made uncomfortable. That's a huge part of the point of a horror movie. It it you know, pokes at our anxieties and insecurities, and I wish that the people who wrote that, like, I'm, maybe it didn't work for them, maybe for some of them it didn't work, but I think for some of them it did, and I wish that they had just said the fact that there's so little dialogue made me uncomfortable, I realize that's the point, something like that, you know, because there's going to be people who are going to read those reviews and are going to miss out on a movie that they might really love, just because they think that it's you know, because for sure there are movies that you know, if if not for the excellent visual storytelling, the movie would really struggle because of the lack of spoken dialogue. But the the let's see, um, yes, the fact that there are so few can, few spoken lines underlines the fact that she is in this very isolated situation she is socially isolated you know even when she goes out and and are near people they might not even speak to her you know so yeah that's extremely isolating and it's very effective and let's see and Okay, so yeah, the following is not a direct quote. I read, you know, yeah. This is some. This is the vibe I got off at least one of them. The fact that it raised questions, not all of which it answered, is bad. Though I won't explain if that's just an automatic no for me, or if I think it's specifically a problem that this is one of those movies that should answer questions. So, yeah, I think that makes clear. I think it's fine if that's an automatic no for you. I think you should make that clear in your review. Like, a lot of these reviews are extremely short, so I don't know why they wouldn't just spend a couple minutes writing out why do you say this is bad, and, you know. I... I think it works for this movie, that not every question is... has a, has a very clear, straightforward answer. I agree that there are stories where that isn't the case, where you should have a clear answer by the end of it. Now, that brings us... So yeah, the, the opening of the movie is quite strong, really setting up how, you know, yeah, the situation for Bryn very nicely. 
So I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. I... I respect the ending. I don't know if I would say that I loved it. I definitely... It is consistent with the vision. It does not feel like a studio you know, person kicked down the door and said, you have to change this ending. It is very much the, the you know, this is clearly what Brian Duffield wanted for, for the end of the movie. And I seriously respect that he went for that. Some user reviewers loved it, some user reviewers hated it. I'm definitely much closer to loving it than hating it. And that's I don't think I'm gonna tell you much about. Okay, yeah. So for as far as the the characters go, I will just say that that yeah, Bryn herself, like, there's clearly she is carrying a burden. That's extremely clear from right away. You know, Caitlin Dever has a has a quite expressive face, and yeah, it is it is very clear that before the events of the movie start unfolding, there's already... And, and don't worry, you don't have to wait long. Um, it is... Yeah. It is, it, stuff starts happening very, very early. But yeah. Um, she's clearly carrying a burden. We get some distinct clues as to what exactly. Uh, you know, many people have and will figure out what it is before it is revealed later in the movie and yeah it, this is this is very much a case where if the lead was not an incredible actor actress this would absolutely fall apart the the yeah 100 percent this movie would not work there's there's a lot of horror movies that work despite some acting that isn't amazing but this is a movie that would have fallen apart 100%. And that's also, like, it seems like some people didn't really, the, it, it, the movie didn't work for them because of the, the, you know, they didn't really care about what happened to her, which is another thing I, I think we got to get better at empathizing with, with people in real life, especially, but also in movies that are different. From what, because, because you know, to be clear, like I, she's not a traditional leading lady. She's not the most charismatic, and I, I can imagine Caitlin Dever is in in real life, and just you know, decreased the the intensity of that for for this role. You know, yeah, she like. Although I, I'm sure the the like the fact that she makes a living off like. Her, her creativity, I, f I feel like that should earn her points for a lot of people. Although maybe some people think the, cre the particular creativity she engages in is, is too creepy. But it is her job. Like, it is how she provides for herself. Now, the... Yeah, the cinematography is very, very strong. The... That's a big part of the the visual storytelling. The way shots are framed, the the way the camera moves, you know, yeah, really really gets a lot across. Uh, same thing goes for the editing, which also like there there are certain things in the movie that it kind of speeds through, and it's very clear. Like in real life, this took much longer. But there's not really any reason for it to take up very much of the movie. And then when there's, like, when there's danger, the, the editing will really, like, stretch out. Like, really keep us in this situation of danger for as long as... Like, it, it never gets to be ridiculous. It never gets to a point where it's just, okay, can we just move on, please? That, it, for, for me... I'm, I can imagine it might have for others, but it's not, like, I've seen horror movies that don't appreciate, like, if you have a really compelling, 
dangerous situation, it's okay to milk it. Again, that's part of why we're here. You know, the it's it's the catharsis of releasing this this fear that, you know, no matter how safe a life we might live in the real world, and many people don't, yeah, it's 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 good to get rid of the the fear in in that manner you know if something can can happen that yeah if if fiction can can get the the fear released you know and the right so the brings us nicely into wait does that not I could have sworn I had it somewhere around here um maybe it's here yeah the budget was 22.8 million and I don't have information. Right, right. Yeah, this was always this headed right to right to streaming. You know, I watched it on Disney Disney Plus. Others watched it on Hulu, and yeah. Um, so we do not have, you know, numbers for yeah. No, no, like box office or something. The twenty two point eight million are absolutely up there on the screen. It does not feel cheap. And they did that, you know, like, like I mentioned, the, the fact that it's, for example, not a huge amount of different locations means that the, 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 the money could go to stuff like special effects. And it absolutely paid off. Like, the, the special effects are seamless. There's not a single, I've, I, you know, I have a bad habit of trying to, to you know, I, I look at every single little thing to, to see. There was no, like, I know what, at least some of what was animated, because I know, okay, that does not exist in the real world. You didn't just find that and, and you know, but it was completely convincing. Uh, yeah, this was filmed in New Orleans, and I don't know, Slidell, if that's how you pronounce it, in Louisiana and they get a lot of authenticity out of the location shooting the music is excellent they really get the the what's the word um, the the music and Caitlin Devers acting are a lot of the time that's how we know you know yeah, is this is this happy or is this scary kind of thing? Because there are times where Bryn is is happy. At at the start, she's you know she's trying to find happiness where where she can. And the the lighting also plays a significant role in that. But yeah, and and this is an, another of the things like if you. If you want to have a really bad experience watching this movie, try muting it. You know, if there's no music, it's yeah, it has way less effect. The sound design is spectacular. I love when horror movies or you know shows games have strong sound design, and this just like yeah, they they that's the thing. Like this is not a movie that, as I've just mentioned, that that oh you know might as well watch it without all any sound. Then no, the sound design, the the crunching and creaking and the the noises made by the the uh, yeah the the major element in the movie, fantastic. And also, I mean, I did already mention that I definitely do think it's scary. Like, it's very scary. Like, there's stuff in this that, you know, like nightmare fuel in, in this. There's there's stuff where some, you know, the the, the movie, the, the situation feels inescapable for a lot of the movie. But there are, it's, there's more than one situation where it specifically feels like okay there's no way there's literally no way 
to get out of this, you know, and they they do a really, really solid job with that. So the movie is 88 minutes, if you don't count end credits, 93 minutes if you do count them, and there's not really any reason to s stay through the end credits. And, yeah, uh, if you give it maybe 30 minutes of your time, and if at that point it just isn't working for you, you may as well turn it off. It's probably not really going to change. And, let's see, yeah, so the, the best elements, the, the exploration of this isolation, and the, the, yeah, just how, how scary, and, and, yeah, uh, let's see. And so yeah, um, the thing I was most worried about was that it would not be able to be compelling throughout the entire thing. And I do, yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. The thing I was most looking forward to was a writer-director passion project. And yeah, the movie exceeded my expectations. I just realized I forgot to watch the trailer to check if... See, the thing is, I decided that I wouldn't watch the trailer before watching the movie because I didn't want anything spoiled. And I meant to watch it right after and before the... So yeah, I would definitely say there are a few... Just looking across the footage of the trailer, there's definitely at least a few things that the trailer gives away that I think you should go into the movie not knowing. But it does also seem like it captures the the vibe of the movie quite well. And yeah, uh, it's difficult to avoid, but the poster definitely does give at least a little too much away. Um, yeah, the, the, the main poster on IMDb does, and I think also the one on... Oh, that's right, yeah. If, if you go to, to Disney+, Plus, it has a still that gives you a decent idea of the vibe of the movie without spoiling anything. But yeah, um, on IMDb and maybe Hulu, I have no idea, I don't have access to it here in Denmark. Um, let's see. And and it is. I, I will acknowledge it's difficult to sell a movie like this without spoiling anything. I still think they could have done a better job on keeping the poster less spoiler heavy. Now, on Rotten Tomatoes, this has an 82% making it certified fresh from critics based on 114 reviews, 93 of which are fresh. The average rating is 7.10 out of 10. Audiences, based on more than 1,000 ratings, gave it a 56%, an average rating of 3.2 out of 5. The criti critics' consensus is a home invasion thriller with a twist. No one will save you serves up more genre fun from writer-director Brian Duffield and proves Caitlin Dever doesn't need much dialogue to command the screen. And, okay, I'll, I'll read it, but it doesn't, okay, audience says, which, yeah, something Rotten Tomatoes recently added. No one will save you, make some interesting and original choices, and Caitlin Dever is great. Very true. And then they go on to say, on the other hand, it's rarely scary. Again, I, just, I wish they would just define what is scary to you if this if this ain't it, chief. And then they go on to say, and the ending might be a letdown. That is definitely. I can I can appreciate that. Yeah, a lot of people will not like the ending. And then the yeah on on Metacritic, it has a sixty. Out of 100 from critics, mixed or average, 56% positive, 31% mixed, and 13% negative reviews. And 
Let's see. Yeah, so the... Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, so the two negative ones... Um, yeah, one of them says, it's, you know... Uh, there's a yeah the movie falls apart because of a frustrating lack of narrative context which I already you know mentioned earlier in this and uh, yeah another the other negative Metacritic critic review says seemingly start starting right out of the gate in the second act then trying to reverse engineer the audience's sympathy and everything else for the unknowable protagonist and. Yeah, that's definitely, I, I get why that bothered some people, and yeah, context is usually, it's very frequently extremely necessary for this sort of thing. I think it worked really well here, and yeah, so on the, yeah, the user ratings, left it with a 6.4 out of 10 generally favorable on Metacritic from, from users 59% positive 26% mixed and 15% negative and let's see yeah um, so yeah, this the negative reviews say stuff that I've already talked about, and yeah, and um, let's see. That brings us to IMDb, where it has a six point three out of ten, based on fifty five thousand ratings. So 24.7% of them gave it 7, 224 gave it 6, 14.2 gave it 8, 11.7 gave it 5, 8.1 gave it 10, 5.6 gave it 4, 5.2 gave it 9, 3.2 gave it 3, 3.1 gave it 1, 2.1 gave it 2. So, you know, overall somewhat positive but not like overwhelmingly so and let's see so yes there are 495 IMDb user reviews or 321 if you hide spoilers I read the top voted 100 of the spoiler free ones 10 people gave it 1 out of 10, 5 gave it 2, 11 gave it 3, 7 gave it 4 4 gave it 5, 10 gave it 6, 24 gave it 7, 20 gave it 8, 9 gave it 9, and another 9 gave it 10. So, yeah, a lot of people really didn't like this, but overall more people did like it. And it was nominated for four awards. Critics' Choice, uh, Caitlin Dever was nominated. And the overall movie, Best Movie Made for Television, was also nominated. It was nominated for a Phoenix Critics Circle for Best Horror Film. And Astra Film Awards for Best Horror Feature. But it did not win any of them. And I definitely... Yeah, those nominations do make a lot of sense. I'm not if, sufficiently familiar with the competition to say if I think it should have won or not. So yeah, the, the special effects, I already mentioned that they're really, really great. There is a pretty significant amount of CGI, and the, the yeah, um, they really made sure that it was convincing and had, like, there's, there's texture to it. Like, you feel like you could reach out and touch this stuff, and that is what you want out of out of CG and that's you know something that today is is possible with CG which is one of the many reasons that they should be paid more for making it the people yeah the the animators and such um, the the yeah they're careful to make sure that every so often something CG interacts 
with a live action element which you know helps further helps sell the illusion there's some quite good stunt work and yeah so it's not extremely violent but what there is is very effective and there are some strong visceral scares in this and I think that covers yeah um my rating is eight unexpected scary stories out of ten and yeah, I, th I think that the movie deserved at least slightly better from the various, you know, user reviewers. I, th I think it's possible that this is a movie that might be like Bear in the Future. And it is maybe also something... I'm not saying they could have, because... Like, the... the for, for one thing, like, lockdown regulations, but... I think this might have done better if it came out during the the COVID. Yeah, uh, let's see the the. Yeah, let's see. He started writing. Uh, yeah, he wrote it as a spec script in 2019, April 2021. It was reported 20th Century Studios had acquired the script, and then they were able to to finish it by this year you know it came out September 22nd this year so yes I realize as I frequently am I am a little late to the party here yeah I'm not saying this could have been made during that but I think it might have resonated more with people if it came out you know the, the way that for example host you know yeah part of why it resonated with a lot of people was that it came out during the COVID lockdowns and was specifically like very of that like it, it it felt like we were right there with it because they were in the same situation we were and th that's not the exact same thing for for Bryn she's not physically unable to go near other people but the social isolation element you know yeah, I, I wouldn't rule out that it might have been partially inspired by that. So let's see, 2019. I, I don't know for sure. It's possible that he had all that already before before COVID. At, at least before COVID became as big of a thing, you know. But, yeah. Um, that is it for the review itself. So, this is where I get into... Spoilers. So if you have not yet watched the movie, please stop watching. I would not want to, to spoil. So, yes, starting with notes taken while watching. And, yeah, right from, from the start, right from the opening shot, this really nails, like, this understands that you only get one opening one opportunity and this is yeah this is a really solid one you know fade in and and slow crane or drone possibly on the the house that that Bryn is in and just really underlining you know this this isolation you know she's not surrounded by people as clearly she would like to be she's she's alone and you know she she gets in front of the mirror and she tries to to force a smile and and do a wave but like she you know it's it's clear that it is a it's it's not coming naturally to her she's not smiling because she's happy she's smiling because she's hoping that people will be receptive to that and deep down she knows they're probably not going to be you can very clear like it's it's such excellent acting you you really don't like i'm so glad that there wasn't like a studio head saying i don't know i don't under i don't understand it uh can we add a voiceover 
you know, I find myself forcing a smile in the mirror. I know no one will return it. Like, how sucky would that have been? I'm so glad that that didn't happen. And I'm not, I'm not dissing voiceover. I think some voiceover is is absolutely amazing, you know. But it, it's, it would be completely wrong for for here. And yeah, she, you know, she's trying to figure out which which dress she wants to go with, and you know, yeah, finding it difficult to to quite be happy with her her choice. And yeah, so she we see that she makes these like dolls, doll houses kind of thing, and sells them to yeah the people of the town. And yeah, you know the the yeah no one returns the the wave. They just look, you know, yeah. They they won't they don't want anything to do with her, and I really love that. At least one of the people who doesn't wave back is specifically the the one that she dances with at, at the end, you know. So, yeah, it it very much is this thing of like, yeah, the the yeah. It, I I like when when a movie can take something from very early on. And have a, a resolution to it near the end. Again, a lesser movie would either have had her dance with someone we've never seen before, with with a guy we've never seen before, or just like have have it be a uh, you know someone she we didn't really see her interact with or something. But the let's see, yeah. Uh, yeah, she has no positive interactions with the townspeople, and this is where I noted she sighs a lot, which again, that's it didn't ruin the movie for me, but I couldn't help but notice. And yeah, she she sits next to the the tombstone, and and again, you know, we we don't need a voiceover saying, you know, I miss my mom so much. It's been three years, you know. No, just you know, we see that she's sitting next to the tombstone and you know has the name says loving mother of Bryn and you know it said you know the 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 year of the the death is 2019 and you know i think it's very shortly maybe it's not so shortly but a little later in the movie we see you know maud died in 2012 and you know, um, Bryn is is writing. You know, it's been ten years to Maud. You know, so so yeah, it is this. Yeah, you you get a lot out of just those little. That that is something I will definitely say. I am glad that Brian Duffield did, does not hate the written word as much as I guess he hates the spoken now. I'm I'm kidding obviously. The the yeah, I'm really glad that they didn't try to have us try to figure it out without written words also. And let's see. Yeah, and yeah, when she writes, you know, dear Maud, I saw your parents today. And, you know, we realize those were the ones she was ducking to hide from, you know. So yeah, you, we can we can tell, you know, that's not, yeah, clearly, whatever happened, whatever exactly it was that happened to Maud, her parents blame Bryn for it, and yeah, we have. Uh, few of the only spoken words the the mailman uh, you know <laughs> pretends he's a basketball player and throws the box at the small mail like the box is like this big and the mailbox is there and not open like obviously he wasn't i i guess he also hates Bryn and she's just happy she got mail i i guess but the, yeah you know and yeah he he throws it and says thank you thank you and 
let's see. Yeah, she she writes, you know, it's been 10 years. I don't think I'll ever forgive myself. And we see a picture of them from 10 years ago that says BFFs. And yeah, we're we're just under 10 minutes in when the aliens enter the movie. Like we I think the first time we actually see an alien is maybe slightly over 10 minutes, but like you can tell that's definitely a UFO, you know, the 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 yeah, the audio and the way it's it's filmed we're hearing a UFO where it's maybe a little bit like POV from the UFO. So I, I really appreciate that. Like, the movie got to that as quickly as at all it would make sense to. Like, it just sets up this this stuff that, yeah. And, yeah, the electricity completely freaks out. And I, I really appreciate, like, I've seen other movies that derive horror from aliens and a lot of the time, it's just like, well, I mean, it's it's scary if the alien, like, jumps out at the, the audience and goes, boo, I guess we'll just do that five million times. And here, no, like, it's super creepy if the electricity freaks out. And that is something that, like, I'm pretty sure actual, you know, UFOs, what is it, sub uh... But believers, what, whatever. I, um, yeah, people who claim to have experienced aliens. You know, one of the things they point to is, yeah, the electricity freaked out. And that is also something that it makes a lot of sense that, like, yeah, you know, the, the, like, some of the time I'm not even sure they're trying to, to, you know, it's just that the, the instruments they use on the house mess up the electricity, you know, which, yeah, you know, like, if you, if you, if you, if too much electricity runs through any electronic device, it's gonna, yeah, it's gonna really mess it up. And, yeah, so she, you know, she sneaks out to, you know, very careful, but there's still the, the creaking of the floorboards, and she runs and hides, and really love the, like, spider-like feet. Let's see. Yeah, it's like the the very bottom of the foot is like is the spider-like thing. I think it has my maybe four legs or something of the the alien, which otherwise I think only has two legs. That was very very creepy. That's you know, spiders just really get to us. Let's see. You know, Jimmy Carr used to have you know used to have to get, get nightmares because of spiders and then he stopped eating them before bedtime and let's see and we have the yeah she uh let's see the the Um, wait, what was the thing with the... F I wrote something about the phone, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Did the... I remember it not working later on. Eh, gonna have to move on. But yeah, you know, she... The, the fridge is, like, opening and closing, which... If no one has done it yet, which I can appreciate, you know, I... Let's see. How is it with... I'm not sure clips of it are, like... Freely available. Let's see. No one will see clips. Um, okay, there are some some clips of it out. Yeah, if you know, if no one has done it yet, I think it would be very funny if you dubbed over so that like the fridge is trying to talk to her, like maybe saying, you know, would be a great help if you would help share my my headshot. Not to brag, but I did also do some, some fridge acting in Requiem for a Dream. The Mangler was a particular dark time for me. You know, some, something like that. 
And yeah, really great when she's like, you know, she's basically, yeah, she's she's essentially stuck right behind the the fridge door, and it's this thing of like, you know, we we hope we know it's not going to happen, but we hope that the alien will just walk past. But no, we see the feet right under the bottom of the fridge, and then like the hands come up. And the head comes, and 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 there are people who say this movie isn't scary. I, 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 what are you talking about? You know, just and right, and and we also we we see you know these are basically the the alien greys, the the let's see uh, area fifty one idea of of an alien, you know, gray humanoid, massive black eyes kind of thing. You know, if if this was the only type of alien at all in the movie, if there wasn't more variety, I would maybe be saying, okay, we've seen that before, though. I, I'm not sure we've seen it quite this convincing before, but I could be wrong. I haven't watched every alien movie. You know, I've watched every movie in the Alien franchise. Should probably have stopped after the first two. And the, let's see, yeah, and it's using, like, telekinesis to, and, yeah, she stabs it in the head. Very cool. And, yeah, we, we realize, you know, she sat there all night, and she's got this, like, thousand-yard stare. And, you know, by the end of the movie, we realize, like, you know, obviously it's already a scary situation, but this probably brought back, like, this This might have, like, triggered a, a PTSD flashback, because she spent ten years blaming herself for, or feeling guilty, because she, you know, hit her BFF in the face with a rock, killing her. <clears throat> Not the most unreasonable thing in the world to feel guilty about. And now she, you know, it was a very similar movement. You know, she's like swinging in the hand. Like it's the, let's see, the rock is with her right hand and the stab is with the left. But it's the very similar movement. And, you know, and it's it's the kind of thing, the first, you know, when you just see the scene, like I didn't realize. When I just saw the scene, I thought, ah, no wonder she's like, she's traumatized. Of course, you know, it's terrifying to come face to face with an alien, to kill a living thing, a sentient being like that. But, you know, by the end I realized, oh, because of also the, you know, having having killed Maud. And, let's see, yeah, and, you know, she, she collects herself, you see her foot is slightly injured, and the phone just does not work, which does, of course, mean that she has to get into town, the car's not working either, which, like, yeah, check that off, the, the horror movie bingo, car won't start. At least this time it's explained. It's not just like, oh, well, you know, plot convenience. You know, that's, a good, again, like, if, if the electrical aspect of, of a car no longer works, yeah, it's not going to be able to start. You know, that's the, the, I'm not a car expert, but... The, the, yeah, the starting the engine requires electrical, yeah. And, yeah, she washes the blood off and sees another house has been attacked. And, yeah, she gets into the police station and, yeah, you know, Maud's father is the chief of police and mother spits in her face and you know the father isn't like you know chiding her for that and saying oh Bryn don't take it the wrong way which again I'm not I'm, I'm not saying I don't understand why I I get it but this does make very clear that the police are not going to help her like imagine if she did go up to the other cops and say you have to believe me you know yeah there's probably not like I don't think he even have has to tell them don't help Bryn they know you know everybody in town knows why Maud died maybe that's a slight exaggeration everybody who knows Maud and or Bryn knows how Maud died 
there's no way that they don't know that about like I'm sure like for a while he was probably uh, you know completely devastated so yeah you know it came up someone mentioned maybe he himself explained it to, to people so they would know why he was you know so yeah and so so yeah I thought they they did a, a good job of that because that's again you know there's a lot of horror movies where the protagonist does not get help and a lot of times it's like well I'm sorry but if you did just this you would be able to you you'd get help but no they they actually explain it and I honestly really appreciate it. it's not that she's physically isolated it's the social isolation which we've seen a lot of movies that use physical isolation and I'm not knocking it I love the 1982 the thing where it's very much physical isolation you know there's not you know there is some social isolation but it's especially like the the yeah the situation is worsened in part because of the physical isolation and yeah I, I honestly I would like to watch more horror movies where it's social isolation I think part of the reason that there's not more and I'm not saying this is the only one I think the reason that there's not more is that certainly here in the West there is a fear of what if the audience doesn't like the main character and to be fair based on a lot of you know reviews by regular people not critics I've you know and, and honestly some critics as well if people don't really like the main character they're not gonna like the movie a lot of the time and social isolation you know either requires a character that at least a chunk of the audience is just straight up not going to like or it's going to feel very contrived like what are these people's problem why are they socially isolating the protagonist so you know, but yeah, if if you know of of ones you think I'd like, please put them in the in the comments. You know, one one example that that springs to mind. I think social isolation works extremely well to make it much more scary in the original Rosemary's Baby. And I'm not I'm not praising Roman Polanski himself. He's obviously a horrible person, but yeah, the the. The gaslighting and social isolation in that movie makes it so much scarier than the because yeah that one it's not really physical isolation she lives in a in a city you know she's there's plenty of people around so yeah and and that is one of my favorite horror movies despite Roman Polanski being a bastard in real life and then we have the let's see yeah there's there's this wall that has like of uh, you know an, an artist rendering of, of a person and you know a lot of like thick locks of red hair and you know Bryn is you know gets gets very close to that wall and you know I, I yeah it's it's not super difficult to, to piece together that is Maud you know that and Bryn at this point has accepted stealth is the way wall hugging is a is a good move here and yeah I really appreciate she got on a bus that's that's such a logical that's the kind of thing there's so many horror movies where it's like leave the thing is in this house just go why are you staying you know and here no she tries you know but they I mean they were waiting for her, I guess. They were like, or maybe not her specifically, but at least no. Because I mean, let's see, the the bus driver seemed to not have been taken over. I guess it's possible they weren't waiting specifically for her, but you know, someone they you know picking off stragglers, something something like that. And let's. See. The yeah, I I love you know that's also it's it can be a bit much if we watch an entire movie and the protagonist is always sad. The relief on her face when she's on the bus is like, 
finally, I'm going to be safe, I'm going to get away, you know, and then it cuts to outside and we can tell there's something off. We don't know what yet. I appreciate that it doesn't immediately, you know, and we see someone move up behind her in the bus, which by itself, you know, what, okay, maybe he wants, maybe he is like the one person in town who does want to talk to her, otherwise he's kind of breaking bus etiquette it's not like there's not other empty seats but you know okay but then we hear this like ah, what's the the, the 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 wheezing you know and we realize that's that's the mailman and he's been uh, attacked and i love that he's actually the first person we see that's been turned into i'm, I'm gonna be calling them alien slaves just to have a specific term you know He's he's an alien slave and he's behaving completely differently than before. You know, he was he was a happy, you know, energetic person, you know, like it's you know, he's it's it's this thing of like this this philosophy of, you know, your job can be fun if you make it that, you know, which obviously is not true for everyone, but you know, and and I do really hope there wasn't something that could break in that box, but okay. You know, but no, he's he's completely different, so it's much more effective like this. And uh, yeah, he you know he attacks Bryn, and there's another passenger who also attacks her, and the bus driver just straight up slams the brakes, and you know someone like slams into the floor, and she does manage to to get out. I guess the bus driver was also taken over later because we don't see him after that point. It's it's fine. It, it we don't need to see it. And you know, we yeah, we see her just running away and the the mailman is, you know, slowly walking you know, behind her. And and later later in the movie he has caught up to her which yeah if he knows where she's going and he keeps walking you know slow and steady wins the race and you know yeah as as she's running and he's moving i'm pretty sure it's just me but i felt like there was a slight like he had a yeah you know, just a little bit of like of um what's the word like the 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 way he was walking he was he was strutting a little bit, you know, non-alien slave ladies, and, let's see, yeah, and, we, yeah, this is when we see the, the tombstone of Maud, and, let's see, yeah, and the, the clouds, and we see the alien slaves holding their hands up in the air like they do not care and yeah it is very clever that the cloud thing that's again i feel like i've heard uh, you know people who believe in alien sightings the, you know oh the clouds were moving weirdly and it is you know it's a it's a clever way to hide your ufo it's going to freak people out significantly less and yeah she she goes home uncovers the the dead alien and goes through what I feel like is fair to describe as a Home Alone prep montage and let's see yeah and the the yeah she's attacked by an alien and she she bites it which yeah that that will do you know that's extremely un unpleasant oh right I, I forgot to mention we also do see the the mailman yeah I'm gonna call the mailman I know it's not necessarily literal like post office whatever um, but yeah we we saw his car knocked over early in the film and yeah she throws boiling water on the the alien attacking which again, like, ow, that has got to hurt. And and again, I appreciate we do see no, it's like screaming in pain and agony, you know. And let's see. 
Um, right, and the, the, she, like, attacks the alien with uh, a stick, and... Yeah, and we see the, the really giant alien that has, like, four legs, or I guess... Yeah, let's, let's go with that. And the mailman showed up. Very cool. Kick. And, yeah, and that was also, like, he's, he's, like, dragging her, and again, like, very scary. Like, I've seen movies where someone being dragged wasn't made that scary, but the music, the camera work, the acting made it really scary. And we have the, um, yeah, she, yeah, she manages to, to kick him, and he gets, like, partially sucked up by the beam that was clearly meant for her. And, let's see, yeah, and he falls, and, yeah, and the four-legged alien walks upside down, very creepy, and she manages to, to set it on fire, because it's stuck in the car, and the car is leaking. You know, it's, it's an American movie, there's at least one car in it, I'm pretty sure it is literally the law. By the end of the movie, that car has to be set on fire and or blown up. Or, or possibly, like, crushed or fall apart, but it has to be... I, I don't know what American filmmakers have against cars. And very tense as she's running from the beam, which, again, like, I, I'm not... I feel like I've seen that in another horror movie, but I don't remember it being as scary as it was here. And, yeah, she gets back into her her room, and we see that she still has Brinny Bird on the... The door, which, you know, that's something she was called as, as a kid, I'm guessing, you know, and she still has it, like, based on, okay, so, the the movie, I guess, yeah, it must be set either 2022 or 2023, because it's been 10 years since 2012. In 2012, they were both, like, 10, which would make her, like, 22 years old or so, and she still has, it. like, if that's you in real life, that's fine, but I feel like in movie visual language, it's kind of saying she hasn't really, like, she hasn't had a normal development since that happened, you know, or since she did that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try not to... to I empathize with her, but she did actually do, like, based, before we actually saw the flashback, I thought, oh, you know, maybe it was an accident or something, and, you know, obviously she she regretted it afterwards, but it wasn't like, oh, she pushed, you know, I, I thought, oh, they pushed each other, and when she pushed Maud, Maud landed face first on a rock, but no, she, you know, Bryn picked up a rock and hit her. You know, and, and it's this thing of, you know, when when we're children, we don't have complete control of our emotions. You know, I, I suppose we never get complete control, but we don't have as much control as at least a, a healthy adult has. I hear. I've never been one. Uh, then we have the... Let's see... Um, yeah, we have the the part where she legit can't move because of the, the beam. That was really messed up. Like, so scary, you know. And there's a part where she gets, like, slammed into the, the uh, ceiling and, and, like, you know, falls down partway. And, you know, it looks like she's going to hit the, hit the floor, but she stopped partway. And the alien gets like really close to her, and then it was like gagging, and it's it's very reminiscent of like you know what we know like you know there are animals, not humans, thankfully, but there are animals here on Earth that do you know it it looks really gross when they're you know yeah reproducing or or you know various. And, and yeah, out comes this, this big, you know, thing, and it, it floats through the air, 
and like unfurls and you know slowly goes in her mouth it's just ugh, disgusting very very creepy and scary very nicely done and let's see yeah and and as soon as it's in you know that it was also creepy when you know the the alien like opens its mouth very abruptly and then Bryn does you know it's it's the telekinesis again just yeah really creepy and you know yeah as soon as it's all the way in she wakes up it was just a nightmare you know and ah oh, the the dollhouse is complete again you know and I really appreciate like it's this thing of like it doesn't it doesn't last for super long before it's very very clear but like you know there i've i've seen yes um rob zombies halloween 2 has someone wake up and realize oh that was just a nightmare and i watched that and i was like well how much of the movie has been a nightmare up to this point how far back does it go and that really hurt the movie's ability to to get me engaged and to to scare me because like I won't reveal whether actually tell you what, you know it's not that like oh it just kept revealing that was all a nightmare but it happened a little too far into the movie and just yeah it wasn't super clear you know, yeah, how much of that was just a nightmare? Because some of it really did not seem to fit the idea of it being a, a nightmare, you know. Here, like, I almost immediately realized this is not that. This is not, because, like, the moment she sees the dollhouse complete, that would mean the entire movie up to that point had just been, a like, as soon as the aliens entered the movie, it would the, the nightmare started for her, you know, which, like, I really didn't get the vibe off the, the movie leading up to that point that the movie would pull such a cheap trick, you know. No, instead, you know, it's like, oh, no, this is not a nightmare. This is, like, or, or that wasn't a nightmare. This is, like, mental manipulation, you know, so that was really, really cool. And, and yeah, you know, we see Maud. And I appreciate, you know, Bryn just immediately says what she's spent 10 years wanting to be able to say. And it's actually, I believe it's the first time that she says a word in the entire movie. And we're very close to the end. And she just says, I'm sorry. You know, that really felt strong. You know, she's not like... You pushed me. What was I supposed to do? No, it's I'm sorry. And then the yeah, and and yeah, you know, she realizes, and I think I think it might be that the aliens didn't realize that this wouldn't work because they were just like, well, you know, what the way, and and this yeah, this probably is what they've done to the other ones in order because, and I love this. She doesn't wake up the same place she was before. She wakes up and she's clearly moved. Like, may, uh, hypothetically, maybe somebody else picked her up and moved her, but it looks more like they got her to move, uh, you know, against her will. She didn't realize she was moving, but they got her to, to leave the, the home, which evidently they have significant problems catching her inside the home. And they're, you know, they, they get her to leave. I'm partially joking. I, I don't think that's as big a problem for the movie as, as some people do but I, I appreciate it. I do think if this had been like an episode of a of a horror show there could have been just one attack in inside the house and you know yeah instead having several does end up making it feel like you know okay why are they struggling so much with this one person there's clear you know at the end we see there's like maybe a dozen or more of these ufos so you know why why don't they just like surround her i guess it's possible that everyone else they encounter is just much easier to capture i yeah anyway um it's so that the movie can happen honestly so then we have the the but but yeah you know 
for most people, when they, they put the thing in, you know, yeah, they, they make them think that this wonderful thing is happening, and the wonderful thing for the other people, you know, is not bringing the dead back to life. It's just, you know, oh, like, you know, if someone is, is happily married, maybe they think that they're, seen, that they're spending time with their family, you know. But Bryn, in order for her to be happy, Maud would have to be alive again, and, you know, she knows that's never going to happen, you know. And I, I feel like it, I've seen this so much that I feel like this probably has a name. There's probably a trope, you know. So they thought this would make me happy. They didn't realize this meant bringing back someone that died. Maybe it's even my fault they died. I know this isn't real. They can't control me. You know, I there's probably a much shorter name for that. Honestly, if you know if if that trope has a name and you know it, please like you know, I I I don't think I'd be able to find it with Google because it's, it's. But anyway, it feels too specific for for. Let's see. Do I want to do I want to say where else I've encountered it? Is that a spoiler? I feel like that's probably a spoiler, yeah. So I will just, yeah, I'll just, I'll, I've encountered it before. Um, yeah, honestly, it's, I'm, I'm comfortable saying that it is in at least, let's see, I, just to make sure I get it right, it is in at least one game developed by Frictional Games, the, people behind Amnesia, the the game series, not the brain injury. Anyway, the, the uh, yes, so, uh, let's see, yeah, so, you know, she pulls the bug out. I really appreciate the immense detail put into both it going into her mouth and, like, when she, like, like, she buries her hand, like, the the there's a there's a very gross joke in there that I won't make and like yanks out this this thing you know and yeah we see there are a lot of UFOs in the sky and the yeah Bryn Bryn and her doppelganger stab each other and yeah the four-legged alien returns and let's see um let's see yeah yeah the um yeah she does get dragged in the in the beam and we see her memories play out you know, the, the um, Wikipedia plot summary describes this as the, yeah, she is psychically probed by the aliens, and, yeah, um, let's see, yeah, honestly, I'll, I'll quote a little bit from, from Wikipedia here. The aliens converse with one another, appear to agree on a course of action. They return Bryn to the deserted world, unharmed and free of their influence. And the, yeah. She's very happy at the end. The, the song plays again, and now she isn't dancing to it by herself. You know, she wanted to dance with other people, and now she can. And they make sure to show the the that, that was another thing that's really messed up like we see the the neck and like the movement under uh, right under the skin of the the thing that's you know the slave maker alien and yeah you know she's happy that the aliens gave her what she wanted she even you know she yeah she dances with several people to to the song which like i it's, it's such a perfect choice of song can can we just appreciate that the the let's see if I can find so the song 
is called Knock on Any Door. And I'm just going to real quick find the lyrics. Um, let's see. So the, the, let's see. Yeah. Knock on any door down in that ho old hometown of mine. You'll find a welcome rain or shine. And let's see. Yeah. And it's about, you know, oh, it's not like fancy, but you know, you feel at home. Knock on any door, you'll find a smile on every face. Friendly folk of town who never ever let you down. Just yeah, um, that's that's what she wants from the star. That's the you know, it's not like radio and oh, that's you know what whatever. She'll she'll accept that that's the no. That is what she chooses to listen to when she has the the you know. Yeah, that's what she wants out of her her hometown, and at the end of the movie, that's what she gets, you know. And the um, let's see, yeah. So that was everything that I had written. I will real oh, there we go. So moving into the final section, notes taken before watching, because there's some really excellent stuff here that. Hold on. It's oh. oh right here we go yeah so the the um, yeah in a 2023 interview with Fangoria Brian Duffield explained his intentions with the ending I think the assumption should be that it's a widespread invasion I mean in, the la in that last shot the aliens are just openly hovering in the sky they're not trying to be cute about it and as for the ending for me it was about Caitlin Dever's character and I guess two things one it was wanting her to wind up somewhere better at the end of the movie than at the start because even before the movie she has gone through quite a bit and then during the movie she's gone through even more and you know I re just really like this kid especially because I felt like she had already been paying for her sins. She knows it, too. Even when she gets spit on, there's no outrage. She's just kind of like, well, this is what I deserve. I'm going to take it and accept it. I'm so sorry I'm alive in front of you. By the end of the movie, I wanted her to come out, on, come out the other side in a better situation. And then on top of that, I think that the aliens... Well, let me put it like this. If you get bit by a stray dog, a lot of people would want to see the dog put down. But you'd also have people that would want to sit with the dog and calm it down, talk to it, to see if maybe the dog can be rehabilitated, become a valuable member of society. I think that is partially how the aliens were viewing us. And so anything that someone did that hurt an alien, I think they viewed as something of an occupational we're at war kind of thing, collateral damage, even if the war is one day long. They're pleasantly surprised by Bryn. They're, they're really interested in people in, and in an anthropological way. They're like... This is a very interesting culture, and we've conquered it, but that doesn't mean we have to erase it. And let's see. So, yeah, um, according to... Um, so, that was from MDB Trivia, and I think that really helps, you know, yeah, helps w well explain. And let's see. Yeah, there are only five words spoken through the entire film, and I feel like in order for that to be... So let, I think they're counting, so let's see, um, five words, because the, the um, yeah, the mailman says thank you. He says it twice, but that is technically only two words, and Bryn says I'm sorry. She also says that twice, but again, you know, in order for it to be five words, what is the fifth one? Is it O? Because the, the... He also said, oh, I mean, yeah, I'm not entirely sure. Um, I quite appreciate that someone, this is very funny to me, um, The only there's only one entry in the IMDb memorable quotes, and it's, it's attributed to the character Alien, and it is click, 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 boah, click, 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 boah, click, boah. Yeah, that's true. That's... That's technically a, a line of just, yeah. Um, I, I gave it one of the 114 upvotes. I don't know who the nine people are who, who downvoted that. That's like, I, that's, that's very funny to me. Um, and, and yeah, 
uh, IMDb trivia, the first official dialogue moment happens at the one hour, nine minute, five second mark. And that's when she says, I'm sorry. And it's true. That's the first time that a character in this clearly s says a line to another character. You know, the, the mailman said something, but that wasn't actually uh, to anyone. It, you know, for, yeah, to himself, I guess. And, yeah, someone pointed out that the, let's see, um, yeah, the fact that um, Bryn killed, the, 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 yeah, the movement that, you know, the, the swinging her, her hand with something in it that when it hits the, uh, the, the target kills them, that was both how she killed Maud and how she kills the alien. And let's see. Um, right, and and yeah. So uh, the IMDb frequently asked questions. Uh, yeah, one person asked, "Why is there no dialogue in this movie?" And the answer: There's only one clear line of dialogue spoken throughout the movie. There were likely artistic reasons for this, but narratively, it's mainly Bryn by herself for the majority of the film. Anytime she goes to interact with other people, they ignore her or shun her. So nobody bothers speaking to her, and she doesn't spot bother speaking to them. And that's also, like, it's not that just, oh, I guess everyone is mute in this town, which, like, I'm not saying there's, you know, you're not lesser if you're mute, but, you know, it it would perhaps feel contrived, and I acknowledge some people feel it's still contrived, but there is conversation but Bryn and thus we are too far away to hear it, to, to make out what's being said. And, you know, essentially it has the same emotional impact on us as if they weren't speaking. But the fact that, you know, yeah, people do talk in, in the movie, we just don't hear what they say most of the time, you know, that feels more credible. And, yes, so, uh, still, I'm to be for the last questions. What does the end of the movie mean? The end, the ending is open to interpretation, and is both bleak and dark, but strangely leaves Bryn happy. Uh, director Brian Duffield believes the ending is real, and highlights humanity's ability to heal and rebuild after tragedy. Despite the apocalyptic world and alien invasion, Bryn finds happiness in a world where her neighbors, infected with alien parasites, treat her with politeness and kindness. And, and yeah, like, I really appreciate it, because it is, like, the, the, um, just, the fact that she actually does feel happy, even though this, this terrible thing has, has happened, you know, yeah, like, I think it really speaks to, like, I, I know, some, some would probably say, oh, she must be a terrible person for that. I think it speaks to the fact that she's that desperate for this kind of, you know, for being treated more, you know, yeah, more, more positively. Um, I wouldn't rule out, I, I'm not sure I saw any, uh, let's see, I, I can't help but wonder if maybe Bryn is meant to be on the spectrum, but I'm not really seeing. Yeah, I just I just googled it, and I'm not really seeing any um, anyone who outright. I you know, and and to be clear, the the you know people on the spectrum are not lesser than neurotypical. Um, but, but yeah, the fact that she says so little, the, the, f uh, and I, I, um, I don't like talking about negative stereotypes, but the, f um, I, I have heard credible, um, apparently people, some, some on the spectrum have a harder time controlling anger than than yeah people who are who are neurotypical and so that would also you know go with that and 
something I've, I've definitely, you know, I've, I've talked to people who are on the spectrum, at, uh, and, and yeah, you know, this, this idea that, you know, you might be happy even though the, the circumstances around you would seem to be sad, you find a way to still be happy, that is something that I've found in, in people on the spectrum. But that doesn't mean, you know, she might be neurotypical. Um, right, so I think that is about, right, right, so a little bit of, yeah, one, um, let's see, um, yeah, one, one, um, user reviewer said the same fight scene recurred like five times with stupidity winning every time uh, I severely dislike the trope of the obviously overpowered and logically unkillable beings dying or being beaten by plot induced stupidity I do think that the movie would have been it, it would have been an overall stronger experience if the movie was maybe like 40 minutes or an hour and there was very little, like, you know, maybe, maybe only one alien over the course of it. And just, you know, for a little while she's able to evade it. But by the end of their one encounter, the, the alien does manage to, to completely catch up, you know, find her, catch up to her. And she's pulled away by the the beam and psychically probed and yeah something I really appreciate this this person points out the movie is a strange combination of annihilation and signs that is very true I I have not yet I know I have not yet watched annihilation I you know I'm I am fascinated by the work of I I actually I don't think I've watched any of his directed I've only watched the stuff he wrote but the, hold on, I'll have it momentarily, Alex Garland, you know, I, I really, really like the, the writing, you know, I think he did a fantastic job writing 28 Days Later, Dread, Sunshine, I'm one of the people who think that the beach, although wait, yeah, that was actually, that was novel, he wrote the novel for that, I'm not sure he wrote the, the script, that might have been... John Hodge, who did, it, yeah, yeah, but, but, yeah, so the core idea is, is his, you know, but, yeah, then he started directing also, and directed Ex Machina, Annihilation, and Men, and I do hear Men is bad, which, yeah, I, I'm not sure if we need that badly, for men to be making movies that try to examine misogyny, I think, like, I, I would have liked if he, you know, tried to, to find one of the, the women directors, one of the female directors out there who are doing that sort of thing and try to help raise her profile instead. Because from what I hear, the big problem with men is that it's a man who doesn't completely understand misogyny trying to explore misogyny um yeah but yeah the the um, let's see um i think that is right uh yeah so one one other um user reviewer says the the let's see yeah so so uh, this is this is an IMDB user review the the user uh, I think it makes more sense if I just so so yes the the um, oh wow this is apparently the only thing they've reviewed Fair enough, I guess they, they really, really hated it. Um, M-Y-A-S-I-N-A-X is how you spell the um, 
IMDb user name, and they, uh, let's see, they write, the main character is portrayed as a very much disliked individual in the small town she resides in due to something that happened in her past. They do such a good job of this, as does the main actress, you will also end up hating her and find yourself rooting for the invaders to dispatch her in some explicit way, especially when her first reaction at contact with these invaders is in fact the very same action that made her so hated by the town. So was it an accident or is it in her nature? And let's see. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, there's there's a little more to the review than that, but I'm really not a big. T tell you what, I'll I'll link it. I'll link it in the description box, and you, I, uh, let's see. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, the the. I feel like they're they're so close to getting because I do think that it's actually I think it is extremely interesting that the um, the fact that it is specifically you know we only realize that later we realize it in retrospect but yes by the end of the movie we understand that the thing she does to stop the alien is in fact the exact thing she does when when in a in a fight with Maud. I think it speaks to the fact that she hasn't moved on from that, which, you know, again, I'm not saying I'm not saying it doesn't make sense for her, but that appears to be the case. She does not seem to have moved on in in those you know, yeah, in, in ten years. That's not nothing. Um, she, I, th I think it also, it's one of those things where, and I, I really appreciate that that's a thing that's, that we're, you know, sometimes is put in, in movies these days. Sometimes the one exact, very specific thing can be exactly wrong for at least one circumstance but exactly right for other circumstance. And I think that's what we're seeing here. Obviously, she should not, Bryn should not have hit Maud. But with the aliens, it's self-defense, you know. And yeah, I, I think that that, like, I, I appreciate that, you know, I'm, I'm sure there are some people who would say that the movie is basically pointless because she spends, you know, she spends almost the entire movie trying to fight, you know, fight against the aliens, run away from the aliens, that sort of thing. And at the end, the aliens are still there, and she's now happy. You know, so, well, couldn't it have been half as long and had, you know, I, and I've made an argument for it to be shorter, but I don't think the fact that she is fighting them and then later you know, not finding them, and that's also, you know, the, the Rotten Tomatoes user summary said that people found the ending to be, you know, a, a letdown. You know, I, I guess they were hoping that the aliens would be defeated, or maybe that Bryn would die at the hands of the aliens. I thought the ending was much more interesting than, than that. Like, if you just want a movie where there are aliens, and it ends with the aliens dying, or the aliens winning... I mean, come on. There's movies out there that scratch that itch. Like, I, I, I hate when people complain about a movie that does something different when there's a lot of movies that do the thing that you would, you know, perhaps expect. But, yeah, I, I do think that... I, I believe that what we see happen in the movie is what literally happens. I, I do... I appreciate, you know, maybe maybe some would say that the entire thing is like, yeah, not not happening. But the movie is about her processing the the, yeah, you know, she feels like she can't get away from the aliens slash her guilt. At the very end, you know, she. 
yeah, I mean, you know, may maybe she does finally forgive herself at the end. I, I think an argument could be made that if she hadn't, she wouldn't be able to, to dance with the, the other townspeople. Um, yeah, you know, I, I feel like that's what's what's going on, you know, because the first time she kills an alien, you know, at the time it looks like, oh, it must be the stress of having killed an alien, but we later realize retroactively it's the the it's because it's it's that's exactly what she did to Maud ten years ago. She hasn't been able to Yeah, you know, in in a way, like she maybe hasn't grown that much in those those ten years. I'm I'm not saying she should have handled the alien differently but I, I do think that the, the, the movie is trying to, you know, draw a parallel here, which, you know, this user reviewer does acknowledge. I think they, they rub right up against the, the, the reason for it. But the, the, yeah, the, I think that, yes, so, to finish that thought, she, you know, it's it's traumatizing for her that she had the the. It's right on the tip of my tongue, I swear. Um, the, the, yeah, the fact that she is able to, because that's the thing. When you've done something bad and you're trying to atone, you would like to think that you'd never be able to do that again under any circumstances. And here she sees, as is true for many people. No, like, it's it's still inside of you, and you have to make peace with that. You know, it's not that you couldn't possibly ever do that again. It's that you choose not to, or you choose to only do it when it's appropriate. You know, because at the end of the day, like, physical violence is not always a negative. It's a negative, you know, when you... It, yeah, she, she shouldn't have hit... She shouldn't have killed Maud... And, you know, a lot of times, physical violence is, it's, it's completely the wrong thing to do. But if you are in a life or death situation, it might be the, the you know, yeah. Um, let's see, and then we have, uh, um, yeah. Um, yeah, you know, the, the movie is very clearly exploring that you know, and I can acknowledge some people would have liked to know the fact that she killed Maud much, much sooner. You know, I, I think it would have been wrong. I, th I think the movie would have been lesser if by the end of it, it still, we still didn't know what had led to the, the town hating her. But the fact that we do get it there at the end, I think is the, yeah, I, th I think that's enough. There we go. Um, but, but yeah, you know, I, th I think it's so much more interesting. There's a lot of horror movies. I'm not sure it's, it's, it's happening very much m anymore. M most of the recent horror movies I've seen don't do this, but there was a while, you know, there's, there's a bunch of 80s horror movies that really aren't a about anything like you just you sit down for 90 minutes you you watch some some blood and gore and and that's about it you know i've i've many times mentioned the the friday the 13th franchise you know i can sit down and watch any of those movies even the remake at any time and and enjoy myself but none of them are good movies and none of them are really like there's a little bit of of attempt at like commentary i think it's is it the ninth one that's like trying to explore America's relationship to violence? You know, the the yeah, you know, it's it's not that there's absolutely nothing, but it's very very little. Most of the time in those movies, the movies don't really have anything to say. They're just, you know, they're they're putting characters on screen, and then you're seeing those characters, you know, killed off or or managed to avoid death. And, and that's it, you know, and I just, I don't think that's very interesting. I, I understand, you know, there's a lot of 80s media that's very, very shallow. 
I just I, I really love when recent movies try to have more more depth than that and and yeah I just, I find it frustrating when people refuse to to really engage with it like it's fine if you don't like it you know that's not nobody likes every good piece of media out there I'm not claiming to be above that there's definitely stuff out there that like I could uh, maybe appreciate yeah the, you know this is definitely some people love this but it's just not for me you know but yeah um that's it for this video so if you like the video please thumbs up subscribe hit that little bell there should be a link to my main channel page one two more links to stuff like relevant playlists i suggest a video for you to watch on screen right about now i put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie i also do a weekly video talking about a horror show which currently is blood curse but i am almost all the way through that i do a weekly video on a murder at the end of the world but that one also that ends uh four days from now and i am probably gonna do some star wars one of the one of the few star wars things that are on disney plus that i haven't already done after that um let's see and yeah uh currently i do a daily video on the danish advent calendar Jupvestebro Westbridge Christmas the, the yeah i'm i'm done with that one on the 24th and then right and on the 22nd i believe we start getting season 2 of what if and i'll be doing a video on each episode of that and as soon as that one's completed its run i am going back to eight Right, Marvel TV, and the, the next one I've reached is Season 4 of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Recently reviewed thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one. In other words, if more of this like this, you're not. You can check out my back catalog as well as catch me next week. I hope you enjoy watching as I enjoy watching and recording. I'll catch you next time. Just gonna go, you know, check my throat, just gonna make absolutely 100% certain that there wasn't an alien spider crawling down my throat overnight and is going to try to control me by bringing someone back from the dead.